Hi, welcome everyone to our first ever coffee hour with WNC Communities. And uh, this is really meant to be a platform um, for all of you to share your best practices with each other. And we're really wanting to build this culture of you know, we're in this together. And if we share our knowledge and our wisdom with each other, it's just going to make Western North Carolina stronger. So um, with that in mind, today we have Peggy Baldwin from Sandy Mush Community Center, who's gonna be sharing about their successes with youth programs. Now, when we had the coffee hour, um, I didn't hit record soon enough. So I'm gonna to try to fill in the part that's missing. So um, to kick us off, I introduced Peggy and she's been volunteering at Sandy Mush for about seven years. And uh, to try to give you the full experience, I'm also gonna share my screen and show you the slides. So a quick rundown of our agenda. Uh, first, this welcome. And then we had a breakout group where we did what we call sip and chat. And that's a chance for all of you to get to know each other one-on-one -on -one so you feel comfortable, you know, picking up the phone and asking, you know, hey, how did you do that rental that you talked about? Or how did you run that youth program? And the idea again is that you guys get comfortable sharing with each other. Um, then we'll have the presentation followed by question and answer, and then a bit of a discussion about how you might implement this um, best practice in your community, and then we'll check out. So um, during the sip and chat, what we had people do was introduce themselves and talk about how are things going with serving youth in your communities. And these are just a few pictures from um, Sandy Mush's wonderful youth programs. They've been at it for about seven years. And I'll do my best to fill you in on the part that um, I didn't record. Okay. So Peggy shared that the sort of initial aim for, for starting this youth program was that there was a lot of isolation in Sandy Mush. So their intent was really to find a way to connect with more people. Um, many of the people are farmers and they live very far apart. So, um, and the community center had been attracting mostly older people and they wanted to get some youth into their community center. So they started off by partnering with 4-H uh, they had a spring fling fundraiser and um, they got the kids involved in, in designing that. Um, they also had a craft person working out of the, the community center who was running a nonprofit. That person also pitched in. Um, they worked with the library in Leicester and they had an email and a Facebook group that families could sign up for the different things that they were offering. And they basically were just sharing info about what was going on in the community. So that's kind of how they started out. Um, but then what they did was they said, well, we need to do some things here in the center. And the first thing they started was a family play group uh, from 1030 to 1230. And so they had the kids come and um, bring their lunch and stay and do a little program uh, that was run by a volunteer. So they did crafts, you know, some of the activities were structured, some were unstructured. Um, Sandy Mush is lucky in that they have a really nice gym and they wrote a lot of grants to get all kinds of equipment. Okay, and then from here, um, we have the pleasure of Peggy telling you about the rest of their program. Yeah, again, the, the other is the youth room and um, the youth room is set up for all ages to have independent play. So there's little uh, block and, and um, truck centers and, you know, things like you would see in a preschool uh, room, as well as shelves of games and things. We went to our upper floor, which is, has not been used since the school was closed and, is not, and we don't have the money to make it usable now. And we just salvaged everything we could from the old school. 
we went, we wrote grants and we went to the community and said, we specifically need these things donated. We go periodically two or three times a year back to the community and say, you know, we need paints, we need Play-Doh, we, you know, we need these kinds of things. And, and the community has been very generous in passing along, which is helpful to them, those things that their kids are not using anymore. That said, we do have some funds from the general fund, the community center to buy supplies and we do continually write grants. But that supports, you know, the things we do with Monday Play Group. We next added some special summer programming and we started being open on school holidays because we realized that we got a lot of kids um, coming in who were in school normally. So we'll go from an average of 15 to 18, sometimes 20 kids on a Monday play group to as many as 30 um, kids consistently, you know, during the summer. Uh, so even though families kind of come in and out, we have a core group who's here almost every week, but we have probably on that list, there's now about 70 families who come, you know, some more than others, and but the, you can regularly count on them to show up. We never know how many people we're going to have. That's a little bit tough, but <laughs> we, we just have accepted that that's the way it is. We have also then added a homeschool group. And again, all of this kind of has grown. We've tried to grow it organically. Um, we have tried to, those who are interested in coming, who are willing to come and who approach us about coming, it, we do the program they're in, programming they're interested in having. Rather than trying to create something out of our own ideas and then convince people that they should come, which no one felt they had the energy, you know, that we had the volunteers to do that. Um, we work with those who are interested in coming. So we had a group of homeschool families come and say, can we do some things more geared more toward elementary age uh, middle in middle school age students? We started off by doing a regular two time a month homeschool meeting. And that has evolved partially because of the pandemic to being, um, we just couldn't ever seem to get a time that everyone could come. So now we have just started this summer doing special workshops that are appropriate for elementary and middle school. And, um, the, and, and then the families just sign up and come. And that way we can have them at different times. Like this month, we're looking at wind and air. So we made balsa planes and taught how to use a ruler and uh, all that was involved in making balsa planes. We're going to make kites. And um, this summer we had printmaking and paper making and um, we are using as much as possible resource people from our local community, as well as parents uh, who are involved in the program and have a special skill that they can share with the children. We've opened, we've had a lot of retired teachers. If you, if you didn't teach, then you may not know that most teachers wind up buying their own materials um, out of their own pocket, you know, out of their own pockets. So when they retire, they have a lot of materials <laughs> that they no longer have a use for. And we have been lucky enough to have several of them donate them to the community center. And so we started a resource library that families could check out teaching materials from the resource library. We also got learning materials on um, our lot. We have a little library and that library has computers and we have some um, ABC, uh, which is um, ABCYA. It's the program Buncombe County Schools uses for um, uh, independent learning on the computer. And we, it's inexpensive and we got that on our computers here or where people who are at the center can access that. Um, 
And we did some pandemic partnering with the school system opening up for kids to come and use the internet. That was actually not very successful, even though we had families early on ask for that. By the time we recruited the volunteers and got opened up, they really had solved that problem on their own for the most part. But um, we have, but it did open the door for us to do some partnering with the school system. Um, I think I saw in the chat, did someone say, is this all volunteer based? It's all volunteer based. It's all volunteers running the program. Volunteers had one thing that Susan asked in her outline is what are some of the biggest challenges? And I'm kind of jumping all, all over her nicely organized uh, outline, but um, that has been a, one of the biggest challenges. I think people sometimes aren't comfortable working with other people's children, even though we are not licensed for childcare. So a parent or an adult or a grandparent has to come with um, either, you know, their family of children, or we have people in the community who will bring a van load of children and just say, I'll be here and I'll be responsible for these kids. And they may come from three, they may have three families full. Um, and they are just willing to stay and, you know, be responsible for those uh, children. So it is possible for people to come who, who can't, don't have an adult in their family who can come. But we do have to have um, an adult here along with our, we usually have one or two volunteers. Sometimes the volunteers are folks like me who are retired and, uh, and we do have a few of the parents who have keys to the center who are willing to open up and close and be that oversight volunteer. So that is a good thing that came out of the pandemic. We stepped up our efforts to get our families to take more ownership and responsibility for the program. Because for a short time until vaccinations came, we lost almost all, I, I was the only older volunteer that stayed around. And for a while, my doctor was like, oh, don't stay inside, you know, um, even though we were wearing masks and that, you know, so that really helped the families, you know, kind of step up. Um, so, so it is volunteer based. You know, one of the needs we know we are not meeting is the needs of those community members who need something like a parent day out, a parent night out, um, part-time daycare. You know, we there are liability issues. Um, our board uh, knows that. Um, and, uh, and they're, you know, it's just difficult. We don't have enough volunteers who are comfortable taking responsibility completely for other people's children. So that's been, a, I think, a challenge um, in the program. Um, it is just, you know, just getting, um, getting enough volunteers who are comfortable coming. What people are more comfortable doing is being those resource people. So one of the pictures you saw is, is a family that uh, the father came here to school from Bhutan. And so he did a presentation on Bhutan. Uh, we have a span, we've had a steady stream of Spanish speaking families who have, we, so we've almost always had someone teaching Spanish, you know, and, and introducing Spanish and Spanish culture, you know, to the children. We um, have um, had lots of parents who are willing to share um, and community members who are willing to come in and share an expertise they have. They're just not as comfortable as sh at showing up, um, you know, every week, every Monday morning or every Thursday afternoon or every Sunday afternoon if we decide in the winter that we have enough volunteers to open up for playtime, you know, for family playtime on Sunday afternoons, which is something we've done. Uh, you know, it, it, takes, it's a, it takes an effort to get volunteers to do that. Um, I'm kind of looking through my notes because I know my time is running out, Susan. 
I think the big you're doing great. This is such rich information. Thank you. Um, I, I think um, I, I realize I've talked about some of the challenges. There's one other thing I, I do want to want to share. I will say, um, in terms of successes, it has done over the that we've been doing this six or seven years. It has changed the dynamic, like we hoped it would, of our larger group events at the community center. We now have families who show up to the other community center events. And that was one of the big things we hoped for, um, you know, and they are involved in the community center and feel ownership of the community center. And um, they feel ownership of the youth program. And I'm hoping this year to get someone uh, from the youth program to serve on the board to get um, a programming team so that I'm not leading that anymore or Diane and I there's we're kind of two real steady volunteers are not leading that in anymore and the parents are leading that a little more um, we have had a regular stream a month hardly goes by that we don't have at least one new family coming. This month has been unusually large. We had five new families who found us and, you know, hooked into the program. They probably won't come every, you know, some of them will, you know, look like they're going to come every week. Others will just come at different times. Some of them came because we had a school holiday this week and they brought their kids and they had other school kids they could connect with. So um, I know we're offering something that is of need. Uh, I also know, you know, we're we're not certainly not meeting every need. Um, one of the things that I I haven't shared from challenges that, from my point of view, sort of watching this and being part of it the whole time, that's been a big challenge for some of the volunteers is, um, and and we tell them, you know, from the beginning, you know, people come to the community center for community. We're all there to be accepted to be loved, to be taken as we are. They don't come here for you to tell them how to raise their kids. <laughs> no, they're not interested in hearing that. And that's not why they came to the community center. And that's not why we exist because we've got a better way for them. You know, we, you know you're welcome to share advice if it's asked for, but um, the parents are more interested in getting advice from one another, in getting community from one another. And other things have grown out of the Sandy Mush Community Center group. Uh, we've had another kind of um, more curriculum every week oriented homeschool group that grew out of it. Uh, we've had um, uh, some of the parents got together and hired a teacher to do a forest school program that, for them this summer. So you know, some things that we either for various reasons couldn't get into the community center. Everything we do with the youth at the community center is free. So, um, you know, we've, we've, never, um, we've never done anything that we've asked people to pay for. There may be a donation jar on the table if you can put in to help pay for supplies. But um, we, you know, so, so things are growing out of that group and that feels good to me because we don't have the volunteers to be everything. Maybe I should shut Thank up. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was great. So at this point, um, after all that wonderful, wonderful um, sharing of successes and challenges and just fantastic content, let's open it up to questions. Does anyone have a question for Peggy? I, I do. This is Janie. I just like to know if there's always a uh, Sandy Mush um, community member present during uh, during these various activities that are taking place. In, in the past, pre-pandemic uh, is sort of the way I'll divide, because as you can imagine, the pandemic has been okay. tough. Um, but pre-pandemic, we always had 
myself, Diane, Ilsa, you know, one of the, not always, we're not all older and retired, though that's the bulk of that uh, group of volunteers. Uh, there are other people who have flexible work schedules, who, um, especially teachers who, for various university teachers, for example, who are teaching part-time. And um, so we've always had that kind of oversight person during the pandemic was the first time we now have four families, four parents that have the keys they need. And they, um, we have had times that they have served as the oversight person. And they understand that that means being sure that they're uh, that the kids are, even though the parents are there, sometimes they get distracted and, you know, being sure that we are, know where the kids are and, you know, and that there's an adult in each of the play spaces, youth, gym, and outside. Um, and, you know, being sure everything's put away and um, that, you know, the center is taken care of. And um, we, we have kind of a little checklist for, for closing up after youth group. So uh, it, it has worked well so far, but I have to say that's been a bit of a revolving door. Um, that we'll have parents that are real active this year who, you know, last year who this year decided, well, it's gonna be another pandemic year. I might as well just homeschool, you know, my kids this year. And so they're not able to be as active and, and those, those keys kind of float around <laughs> those families, you know, but. Thank you. Great. Could you give us an estimate of the population that you're serving, the number? Um, well, so we, we, we do send out, someone was mentioning maybe doing too much on Facebook. We, we have an email newsletter and uh, on Facebook and Instagram, but we also do a print newsletter uh, twice a year. Uh, so because of that, you know, I, I know that there's, there is, we've been sending that print newsletter to 600 families, but we know that we're drawing families from outside of that. And so this time we're going to send it to 1100 families. Wow. And that's going to pick up uh, the little Sandy folks, which is mostly Madison County. And it's going to pick up some of the we call, I call them far Lester folks. They're, they're kind of in Lester, except they're maybe they're in Sandy Mush. It all depends on your point of view. And so we'll, we'll pick up those families. Um, there is, there's not a lot of youth programming at Lester Community Center. And we do a lot of, you know, kind of coordination between those two community centers. And so we do get quite a few families from Leicester and Alexander who would normally go to Leicester Community Center, you know, maybe, but there isn't a lot of youth programming there. Um, so we, we, get, we get those families. Uh, we don't get many families from Haywood County, probably because the road is such that in the winter, you've got to drive all the way around Newfound to get to us. And it can, that's a long time in the, that can take quite a drive in the winter. Um, so, you know, we don't get as many from Haywood, but quite a few from Madison County. So I think, you know, I haven't counted recently. And like I say, we're always adding names to that family group. Um, and, and the board members are on there too. But the last time I counted, it was close to 90. I'm gonna, you know, in the last time I counted families, it was 60. So I'm gonna estimate we've got about 70 families and they don't all come at once. Yikes, I don't know what we would do if they did. Actually, pre-pandemic, we were in a situation where we realized from the feedback we were getting that that summer that wound up being the first pandemic summer, that we probably, we could have days where we might have 40 to 50 kids. And even though they'd have an adult with them, so we'd have a lot of help, that requires a whole nother level of organizing what those kids are doing. Um, you can't have just a couple of activities going and, and these free play sites, you know, you're going to have to be a little more structured. So we actually had quite a lot of uh, resource people then structured activities that we had planned, and we were going to try our first half-day camp also, 
uh, for that first summer. And then the pandemic hit and we wound up not even being open that summer. And the parents came to us in August and said, let's go to the board and see if we can use safe practices meet outside and be able to start back in September. So we did that. Last winter was hit or miss, mostly depending on the weather, because some families didn't ever want to go inside, you know, until they had vaccinations. Um, now we're back to mask inside, but, you know, about 70% of the adults, all the volunteers are vaccinated, about 70% of the families are vaccinated. Of course, the kids are not vaccinated. And uh, so it's, you know, that, of course, has been a struggle like it has been for everybody, for everything. But that's, that's roughly, you know, um, I think who we're, you know, kind of who we're targeting. So much of it now is word of mouth. A new family will walk in the door and they'll say, I met Elise at the Leicester Community Center playground. And she said, come over here, you know. And so that that's the kind of, it, a lot of it is word of mouth. And um, so, you know, anybody these families hear of who live, from Lester, Alexander, we, we do have a real active family in Weaverville, but anybody, you know, anybody they meet, they just tell them, come on out. And um, so they do. I'll tell you who I think we're not getting, um, except in that school age group, is those parents who, who um, need to work, you know, have preschoolers and need to work. And of course, they don't have the flexibility to get them moved unless they have a grandparent. We have some of them who have a grandparent who brings them, they bring them every month. We have quite a few grandparents, probably a third of the group are grandparents who bring them every Monday. And in some cases, that's allowed them to not have to do daycare that day, especially if they were doing a short day. You know, they'll bring them out every Monday, spend four or five hours at the community center, and then it's time for you know, they, they can come and pick them up, but. Great, thank you. Are there, are there any other questions? I, yeah. I wondered about your, um, is there any kind of vetting process or application for the volunteers that get your keys? And when you put out the jars, do you get revenue with that or is that? Okay. Um, you know, the vetting has been, I, I, I guess it's kind of been me and Diane mostly, you know, sort of saying, you know, um, like, like we have a family that uh, is traveling for the year because the, the father's a journeyman electrician. And so the family decide to travel with them. They're going to, they're sending via grandparent their keys back. We already have a family who she is real active does a lot of the pro, you know, has programming ideas, is real responsible. And we're going to ask her, would you be willing to have keys? Our treasurer has a form that anyone who has keys to the building fills out. For our purposes, they only need an exterior door key and the, the youth room and rec room are the same key. So they only need two keys. They don't need keys to everything. Um, and, and actually the kitchen too, that gives them, we do some cooking with the kids. We, you know, we teach them how to cook. And so we can go in the kitchen, you know, they can get in the kitchen too. Um, and so, yeah, the vetting, I guess it's been kind of uh, not real formalized. Um, um, your other, oh, when we put on the table, yes, we get some, you know, not, not a whole lot. What, what usually, um, I mean, we have a lot of families that they they can't, you know, their kids aren't in summer camp because they can't afford to go to summer camp. You know, they're um, they they couldn't. Um, we we got very lucky to have a family who will donate a little bit every year, earmarked just for use for resource people. So if some parent, if a parent or community person comes in and does a one-off with our group, we, we don't even offer anything. But we have actually had people do three to six week classes, uh, two and three hour classes, workshops with the homeschool. We, so we use some of that resource money to at least give them $50 a session because, you know, having taught and having talked with them, you know, they come in 
they're often people who've done this before. So they come in with goals and objectives and they spent a lot of time on that before they ever even showed up to teach for three hours. So besides covering their supplies, we try to give them $50 a session if they're doing a longer program like that. And so then we put something on the table and, you know, maybe for a three week class, you know, maybe we'll collect $50 over the three sessions and the $50 might, you know, if we were careful about supplies, it might cover the supplies at, at least. So um, we're, the community center gives us, um, I think last year, I think we're up to about $750 a year that they give us. And well, you know, it's not like the community center has a lot of money floating around. So we try not to use it and, and hold it over for the next year if we can. Um, but, you know, we do have a little bit of supply money. So that helps, you, you know, if you have to raise money, every, you know, here you got an idea, now you got your volunteers and now you got to raise money. That becomes almost more than you can get done. Great. So if there, um, unless there's another question, I thought we could move into just a general discussion of how do you guys see yourselves trying to implement some of these best practices in your own communities? Well, it sounds like to me that your isolation is actually helping you in that because there's a need that you're fulfilling. Um, exactly. Anytime, you know, anytime they don't have to drive to town to access something, everybody is beyond thrilled, you know, and I, I think isolation uh, does help in that. Um, I don't know if there's um, I'm always impressed every time I come to a Western North Carolina communities event um, at what I hear from Shiloh Community Center, I don't know, which is in Asheville. I don't know if there's anyone here from Shiloh, but no, Shiloh no. has no. a lot of really great youth. I mean, I'm just amazed the things I hear. There's also one out toward Cherokee. I think it called, they call themselves Multicultural Center, maybe. Um, and they do some amazing things with youth too now I don't and I don't know how isolated they are but like I know Shiloh um you know is right in town but I think they get quite a lot of youth um but it, it definitely uh, being out here and people get weary of driving to town one of the reasons we have a lot of homeschool families is because they um you know, may it, I mean, even Lester Elementary, I mean, even once they get to middle school and high school, you know, the kids have to go to town to school. And that's what really those consolidated schools, you know, caused uh, the real rural areas, uh, you know, some of the breakdown of um, people, but because the kids are going to school with kids who live they don't just live in Sandy Mush. So, you know, that uh, caused some of the breakdown, I think, of some of the community center um, uh, children and youth. You didn't have a cluster anymore. So we're trying to address the cluster that's here, which I think is one of the reasons that it, it has seemed to be preschool and elementary age families, because once kids get to you know, particularly beyond middle school, they are involved in a lot of things that rotate around their school. And for the kids out here, school's in town. Irwin is, you know, essentially in West Asheville. So how far is that drive to go to town? Well, it, the drive really is, is just 30 minutes. Um, to get to West Asheville is about 30 minutes. To get downtown is about 35 you know, to get over on the other side of town, depend on traffic, you know, can take 45, 50 minutes. Uh, for those of us who live out here and get used to it, it's nothing. For other people, you'd think that you'd ask them to drive to Knoxville, you know, <laughs> it's 
like an amazing. <laughs> they, you know, they just, oh no, can't do that. <laughs> um, I'm curious. Uh, I know that in the breakout session, Andrew was particularly keen on hearing best practices from other people as well. So I don't, don't know if um, maybe Norma, since Shiloh was mentioned, if you'd like to share a little bit about something that's been particularly successful with you guys. Okay, thank you. And, and thanks for mentioning Shallow, <laughs> um, <laughs> Peggy. Uh, as, as you know, we, we continue to strive to, to teach our youth. We have the Youth Stipend Program, which is, um, is, it is sort of set up around our community garden. And our community garden is where we plant vegetables and we have a orchard of fruit trees and things and blueberries and all these things. And the children learn or the youth and, the, uh, and some adults learned uh, how to plant and harvest uh, the different vegetables. We have financial literacy classes for them, trying to teach them the importance of finance uh, we uh, work with uh, self-help in, in trying to secure them and making sure that they start a bank account and they know how to save money. And we have a roadside stand which they can sell different things and be in charge of that. Um, recently, with a grant, they did a, um, a a video uh, of cooking, uh, cooking a meal. They they wrote the recipe and everything, and they did um, the cooking and they videoed it, which was a great experience for them to do, and they enjoyed that. Uh, we have a string, a little stream that runs on the property. And of course, we monitor the water and things, so they get involved with the environmental things that's that's going on in the water and make sure it's tested each time, and they help with that. Um, oh, Norma, oh, somehow I'm you sorry. Can I hit the uh, In addition to that, um, uh, there's the maintenance of the. Um, of the garden and also we have a amphitheater there and a pizza oven that uh, they enjoy when they make pizza and things and these are all things to keep them involved in in the whole uh, environment. We have some land that was donated to us and we're in the process of trying to do a resource center but in the Meantime, we have a bird sanctuary there. So we bought um, um, the bird houses and things and they decorated them and then they put them up. So, so we have that also that we're doing. And one of the things that really bothered me uh, before COVID and we had started working on it and need to do it again, is that the, I understand that they do not teach cursive writing, writing in school anymore. And that just blew my mind <laughs> when, when I heard that. So we were having classes in that to make sure they learn how to write in cursive and read it because you have to know how to read it also. So I would suggest in any program, please teach these young people to write in cursive and to read it because they do have to write their name, <laughs> if nothing else on a lot of things. So. <laughs> Norma, thank you so much. That is such an incredible list of a fantastic mm -hmm. programs you guys have there. Thank you. Well, it's clear that this topic is a deep one and we could you know, probably have at least another, maybe two more coffee hours about it. Uh, what I'd love to do, um, we just have a few minutes left. Um, is just do a quick little checkout with all of you. So if what I'd love to do is just each of you could just um, just give like two or three words about how you feel about today's session or something that you're taking away from today's session. 
So I'll I'll start to kind of show you what I mean. Um, uh, inspired and thrilled. Informed. Oh, you took my word. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> More connected. Uh, Planning think, to continue. <laughs> okay. uh, very joyful to see everybody and to learn different things that others are doing. This has been helpful for me. Uh, give me ideas to take to the membership to talk about uh, trying to reach out to the families and kids in the neighborhood. That's more than a couple of words. I'm sorry, Susan. <laughs> I'm always inspired when I come to a WNC communities of uh, anything, you know, just to hear what other people are doing. It's so much creativity. Yeah. <laughs> Tammy and Gina, did you get a chance to check out? Uh, yeah, I agree. It's very inspiring and it's nice to be connected to a community of other community centers. <laughs> It was encouraging to hear the feedback and that will give me some ideas and things to take back to our community clubs to some things they've tried. And so it, I'm now I'm saying more than I should, but that I've learned something from this. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, grateful to you, Peggy, for your fantastic presentation. It sounds like, you know, everyone got what they were looking for today. One last thing I wanted to say is I'm dropping into the chat a link to our schedule of events so that you can continue to learn whatever it is you're interested in. So our next class coming up is on October 20th. I mentioned it um, in a breakout session, but I didn't tell you guys. Um, Becky Bowen from County Extension, she's a lawyer. She is going to give a presentation on how to write great bylaws. That's a workshop from 10 to 12 on Zoom. And if you click on that link, you can scroll down and find the link inside of that uh, to register. And our next coffee hour is going to be on broadband. So again, these are gonna be every month. Um, this month is unusual in that we're on the second Wednesday, but normally it'll be on the first Wednesday of each month. So again, look, check out the schedule and the link to register is there. Okay. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you again, Peggy. And we look forward to seeing you on our future coffee hours and events. Take thank care, you. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to. Thank you. Mm -hmm.